Well, it finally happened today. One of my QNAP NAS units died, so I want to cover how to migrate your drives into a replacement NAS unit, either as an upgrade or as a repair. If you want to find out more about how this is done, then stick around for the rest of this video. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit notifications so you'll be notified when there's new content. If you find this video useful, please don't forget to give it a like as it does support the channel. To set the stage, I've had this unit since about mid-2018, and it's one of the oldest NAS units that I have. It's been a real workhorse for me, and I've had really zero problems with it, at least until now. I was trying to access some files and found that I couldn't actually connect to the device. When I got home, I went to the office and saw the dreaded blinking red light. The unit wasn't making any noise, and the hard drives and the fans, they were all completely off. I tried several times to reset, but no luck. So after a bit more troubleshooting and did a little bit of research, it became pretty obvious that the unit had died. I was pretty confident that the drives were intact and the data was intact and that the unit had just failed. So I sent out to find a replacement. One of the most important things in getting a replacement NAS, either, as a, either to replace a defective one or as an upgrade, is to make sure that you check the QNAP compatibility list. There are certain models that can't migrate directly to other models, so you have to run the compatibility check before you go out and make your purchase. I'll leave a link in the notes to the compatibility site so that you can check your particular model before deciding to buy it. The second thing you need to know is the licensing. If you bought any licenses, you need to make sure that it transfers. Some of the license that you purchase for your older unit is not going to be transferable and it has to be repurchased again. The model I decided to buy was a QNAP TS453D. It's not the newest model, but it has four bays, an Intel Celeron quad core, at a really attractive price point. For the most part, it's an upgraded version of the one I'm replacing, and comes with two 2.5 gigabit network adapters, and more importantly for me, it has a PCI Express expansion slot so that I can put my 10 gig network card in it. It has a slightly faster processor, faster memory to round out the package. Just to verify, let's start by checking the NAS compatibility site so we can walk through the process. The process is pretty straightforward. You pick the operating system, which for most of us will be QTS. Select the source NAS information, such as the number of bays and the model number, and then fill out the destination NAS information with the number of bays and the model number that you're planning to purchase, whether it's for an upgrade or a repair. And you'll be prompted with either a green check mark telling you everything's okay, or a red X telling you that they're not compatible as far as a direct migration. If your NAS is still working and you don't get the green check mark for a direct migration, you'll have to use one of the uh, other methods of copying your data, which is a lot more trouble. For my purposes, I needed a compatible NAS as my current NAS wasn't working. So I needed to make sure that I got one that could support direct migration. A couple of generic notes that you should be aware of, and this is of course assuming that you have a working NAS that you can actually make some changes, but you might need to disable the SSD caching on the source NAS before migrating to the new NAS. Also after migration, because of hardware differences, you may see a couple things that are different. Your storage settings, including Q-tier and SSD caching, may have changed. Also your network and virtual settings, including port trunking, virtual switch, Thunderbolt, and USB quick access may also have changed due to differences in the hardware. If the destination NAS has less RAM than the source NAS, some features and applications may not be supported, such as virtualization, queue search, and snapshots. So you may actually have to, at some point, upgrade your new NAS to equal to or more than the same RAM configuration. In my case, I needed to remove the old drives and I also needed to remove my 10 gigabit network card. One important thing to remember is that you need to label your drives with the drive number so they can be inserted into the new NAS in exactly the same order. As you can see, I've removed all the drives and labeled them so that I can put them back into the unit in exactly the same order. The next step is to remove them from their trays as I'll be using the trays from the new device. And the one last thing is I do need to remove my, P my 10 gig PCI Express card from the expansion slot 
as I need to transfer this to the new NAS as well. Okay, now that we've removed all the old hardware, it's time to populate the new NAS. As the drives need to be out of the device to install the PCI Express card, I need to put the 10 gig card in first before installing any of the drives. With the card installed and the unit reassembled, it's now time to put the drives in, taking care to put them in in exactly the same sequence as the original NAS. So I hooked everything back up and powered up the unit. If you don't already have it, you might want to get a hold of QFinder Pro as it might make your life a little easier. However, you can do everything that we're doing today from the web browser. I'll go through the process using QFinder as it's probably the easiest way. Once the new unit is booted, it will appear in the QFinder app. QFinder will show you a few items that you'll need that are important, such as the IP address and the MAC address. If you're going to do this from the web browser, you'll need to know that IP address so that, so that you can call up the web interface directly. The other thing is it shows us the firmware version. And there's a link that allows you to update the firmware directly from the QFinder app, which is really useful. Click it on the download arrow, or you'll be prompted for your username and password, and it'll begin to download and install the firmware automatically. Once it's finished, the system will restart. And once it has restarted, you may get one of these somewhat intimidating prompts that your server is not yet initialized. And it'll ask you if you want to start the smart installation guide. Don't do this. Make sure you select no. It's critical at this point that you say no and, and manually shut down the device. Take note of the IP address as after it's restarted, you'll want to go straight into the web browser and log in the way you normally do. Assuming that everything went according to plan, everything should be as it was before when you log in. There may be some house cleaning things that you have to do, especially if the unit wasn't shut down properly. So you may have to run a file check on all your volumes just to make sure of their integrity. And also if you've reconfigured your NAS name during this process for some reason, like I did, um, you may have to reconfigure some of your services such as QSync, as these programs are configured based on the NAS name. Also, if you don't have a static IP and you have any map drives, or you're accessing them through the file explorer, you'll need to adjust those particular configurations as well. To make things a little easier for you now and in the future, I always suggest using a static IP address on your NAS units. It makes things a lot easier on your home network. Uh, even things like recovery and upgrades become a lot less painful. And it doesn't break all your map drives or any of the IP address paths that you may have set up. So after about 20 or 30 minutes of checking things out, making some minor adjustments and verifying that everything was working well, the migration was a complete success and all my data was there and accessible. I didn't need to recreate any accounts or shares and other than having to reconfigure QSync as a result of renaming my NAS, everything was the way I left it. Though it's never fun when a piece of hardware fails, recovery from this was pretty painless. If you found this video useful, then please give it a like. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please do so as it does help to support the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.